Question 35 of Summa Theologica Secunda Secundae, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Charity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica Secunda Secundae, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Charity by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 35 of Sloth in Four Articles We must now consider the vices opposed to the joy of charity. This joy is either about the divine good, and then its contrary is sloth, or about our neighbor's good, and then its contrary is envy. Wherefore we must consider, one, sloth, and two, envy. Under the first head there are four points of inquiry. First, whether sloth is a sin. Second, whether it is a special vice. Third, whether it is a mortal sin. Fourth, whether it is a capital sin. First article, whether sloth is a sin. Objection 1. It would seem that sloth is not a sin. For we are neither praised nor blamed for our passions, according to the philosopher in Ethics 2.5. Now sloth is a passion, since it is a kind of sorrow, according to Damascene in On the True Faith 2.14, as we stated above in the Pars Prima Secundae, question 35, article 8. Therefore, sloth is not a sin. Objection to. Further, no bodily failing that occurs at fixed times is a sin. But sloth is like this, for Cassian says in his Institutes 10, The monk is troubled with sloth, chiefly about the sixth hour. It is like an intermittent fever and inflicts the soul of the one it lays low with burning fires at regular and fixed intervals. Therefore, sloth is not a sin. Objection 3. Further, that which proceeds from a good root is, seemingly, no sin. Now sloth proceeds from a good root. For Cassian says in his Institutes 10 that sloth arises from the fact that we sigh at being deprived of spiritual fruit, and think that other monasteries and those which are a long way off are much better than the one we dwell in. All of which seems to point to humility. Therefore, sloth is not a sin. Objection for Further, all sin is to be avoided, according to Ecclesiasticus 21.2. Flee from sins as from the face of a serpent. Now Cassian says in his Institutes 10, Experience shows that the onslaught of sloth is not to be evaded by flight, but to be conquered by resistance. Therefore, sloth is not a sin. On the contrary, whatever is forbidden in holy writ is a sin. Now such is sloth, akchedia, for it is written in Ecclesiasticus 6.26, Bow down thy shoulder and bear her, namely spiritual wisdom, and be not grieved, akchedieris, with her bands. Therefore sloth is a sin. I answer that sloth, according to Damascene, in On the True Faith 2.14, is an oppressive sorrow, which, to wit, so weighs upon man's mind that he wants to do nothing. Thus, acid things are also cold. Hence, sloth implies a certain weariness of work, as appears from a gloss on Psalm 106, verse 18. Their soul abhorred all manner of meat. And from the definition of some who say that sloth is a 
sluggishness of the mind which neglects to begin good. Now this sorrow is always evil, sometimes in itself, sometimes in its effect. For sorrow is evil in itself when it is about that which is apparently evil, but good in reality, even as, on the other hand, pleasure is evil if it is about that which seems to be good but is, in truth, evil. Since, then, spiritual good is a good in very truth, sorrow about spiritual good is evil in itself. And yet that sorrow also which is about a real evil is evil in its effect, if it so oppresses a man as to draw him away entirely from good deeds. Hence the Apostle, in Second Corinthians 2.7, did not wish those who repented to be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Accordingly, since sloth, as we understand it here, denotes sorrow for spiritual good, it is evil on two accounts, both in itself and in point of its effect. Consequently, it is a sin, for by sin we mean an evil movement of the appetite, as appears from what has been said above, in question 10, article 2, as well as in the pars prima secundae, question 74, article 4. Reply to objection 1. Passions are not sinful in themselves, but they are blameworthy in so far as they are applied to something evil, just as they deserve praise in so far as they are applied to something good. Wherefore sorrow in itself calls neither for praise nor for blame, whereas moderate sorrow for evil calls for praise, while sorrow for good, and again immoderate sorrow for evil, call for blame. It is in this sense that sloth is said to be a sin. Reply to Objection 2. The passions of the sensitive appetite may either be venial sins in themselves, or incline the soul to mortal sin. And since the sensitive appetite has a bodily organ, it follows that on account of some bodily transmutation a man becomes apt to commit some particular sin. Hence it may happen that certain sins may become more insistent through certain bodily transmutations occurring at certain fixed times. Now all bodily effects, of themselves, dispose one to sorrow, and thus it is that those who fast are harassed by sloth towards midday, when they begin to feel the want of food, and to be parched by the sun's heat. Reply to Objection 3. It is a sign of humility if a man does not think too much of himself through observing his own faults. But if a man contemns the good things he has received from God, this, far from being a proof of humility, shows him to be ungrateful. And from such like contempt results sloth, because we sorrow for things that we reckon evil and worthless. Accordingly, we ought to think much of the goods of others in such a way as not to disparage those we have received ourselves, because if we did, they would give us sorrow. Reply to Objection 4. Sin is ever to be shunned, but the assaults of sin should be overcome, sometimes by flight, sometimes by resistance. By flight, when a continued thought increases the incentive to sin, as in lust, for which reason it is written, in 1 Corinthians 6.18, fly fornication. By resistance, when perseverance in the thought diminishes the incentive to sin, which incentive arises from some trivial consideration. This is the case with sloth, because the more we think about spiritual goods, the more pleasing they become to us, and forthwith sloth dies away. Second article, whether sloth is a special vice. Objection 1. It would seem that sloth is not a special vice. For that which is common to all vices does not constitute a special kind of vice. 
but every vice makes a man sorrowful about the opposite spiritual good for the lustful man is sorrowful about the good of continence and the glutton about the good of abstinence since then sloth is sorrow for spiritual good as stated above in article one it seems that sloth is not a special sin objection to further sloth through being a kind of sorrow is opposed to joy now joy is not accounted one special virtue therefore sloth should not be reckoned a special vice objection three further since spiritual good is a general kind of object which virtue seeks and vice shuns it does not constitute a special virtue or vice unless it be determined by some addition now nothing seemingly except toil can determine it to sloth if this be a special vice because the reason why a man shuns spiritual goods is that they are toilsome wherefore sloth is a kind of weariness while dislike of toil and love of bodily repose seem to be due to the same cause notably idleness hence sloth would be nothing but laziness which seems untrue for idleness is opposed to carefulness whereas sloth is opposed to joy therefore sloth is not a special vice on the contrary gregory in his commentary on job thirty one forty five distinguishes sloth from the other vices therefore it is a special vice i answer that since sloth is sorrow for spiritual good if we take spiritual good in a general way sloth will not be a special vice because as stated above in the pars prima secunde question seventy one article one every vice shuns the spiritual good of its opposite virtue again it cannot be said that sloth is a special vice in so far as it shuns spiritual good as toilsome or troublesome to the body or as a hindrance to the body's pleasure for this again would not sever sloth from carnal vices whereby a man seeks bodily comfort and pleasure wherefore we must say that a certain order exists among spiritual goods since all the spiritual goods that are in the acts of each virtue are directed to one spiritual good which is the divine good about which there is a special virtue notably charity hence it is proper to each virtue to rejoice in its own spiritual good which consists in its own act while it belongs specially to charity to have that spiritual joy whereby one rejoices in the divine good in like manner the sorrow whereby one is displeased at the spiritual good which is in each act of virtue belongs not to any special vice but to every vice but sorrow in the divine good about which charity rejoices belongs to a special vice which is called sloth this suffices for the replies to the objections third article whether sloth is a mortal sin objection one it would seem that sloth is not a mortal sin for every mortal sin is contrary to a precept of the divine law but sloth seems contrary to no precept as one may see by going through the precepts of the decalogue therefore sloth is not a mortal sin objection to further in the same genus a sin of deed is no less grievous than a sin of thought now it is not a mortal sin to refrain indeed from some spiritual good which leads to god else it would be a mortal sin not to observe the counsels therefore it is not a mortal sin to refrain in thought from such like spiritual works therefore sloth is not a mortal sin 
Objection 3. Further, no mortal sin is to be found in a perfect man. But sloth is to be found in a perfect man, for Cassian says in his Institutes 10.1 that sloth is well known to the solitary, and is a most vexatious and persistent foe to the hermit. Therefore, sloth is not always a mortal sin. On the contrary, it is written in Second Corinthians 7.20, The sorrow of the world worketh death. But such is sloth, for it is not sorrow according to God, which is contrasted with sorrow of the world. Therefore, it is a mortal sin. I answer that, as stated above, in the Pars Prima Secundae, question 88, articles 1 and 2, mortal sin is so called because it destroys the spiritual life which is the effect of charity, whereby God dwells in us. Wherefore, any sin, which by its very nature is contrary to charity, is a mortal sin by reason of its genus. And such is sloth, because the proper effect of charity is joy in God, as stated above, in question 28, article 1, while sloth is sorrow about spiritual good inasmuch as it is a divine good. Therefore, sloth is a mortal sin in respect of its genus. But it must be observed with regard to all sins that are mortal in respect of their genus, that they are not mortal save when they attain to their perfection because the consummation of sin is in the consent of reason for we are speaking now of human sins consisting in human acts the principle of which is the reason wherefore if the sin be a mere beginning of sin in the sensuality alone without attaining to the consent of reason it is a venial sin on account of the imperfection of the act thus in the genus of adultery the concupiscence that goes no further than the sensuality is a venial sin whereas if it reach to the consent of reason it is a mortal sin so too the movement of sloth is sometimes in the sensuality alone by reason of the opposition of the flesh to the spirit and then it is a venial sin whereas sometimes it reaches to the reason which consents in the dislike, horror, and detestation of the divine good on account of the flesh utterly prevailing over the spirit. In this case, it is evident that sloth is a mortal sin. Reply to Objection 1. Sloth is opposed to the precept about hallowing the Sabbath day. For this precept, in so far as it is a moral precept, implicitly commands the mind to rest in God, and sorrow of the mind about the divine good is contrary thereto. Reply to Objection 2. Sloth is not an aversion of the mind from any spiritual good, but from the divine good, to which the mind is obliged to adhere. Wherefore, if a man is sorry because someone forces him to do acts of virtue, that he is not bound to do, this is not a sin of sloth. But when he is sorry to have done something for God's sake. Reply to Objection 3. Imperfect movements of sloth are to be found in holy men, but they do not reach to the consent of reason. Fourth Article whether sloth should be accounted a capital vice. Objection 1. It would seem that sloth ought not to be accounted a capital vice. For a capital vice is one that moves a man to sinful acts, as stated above in question 34, article 5. Now sloth does not move one to action, but on the contrary withdraws one from it. Therefore, it should not be accounted as a capital sin. Objection to, further, a capital sin is one to which daughters are assigned. Now Gregory, in his commentary on Job 31.45, assigns six daughters to sloth, notably malice, spite, 
faint-heartedness despair sluggishness in regard to the commandments wandering of the mind after unlawful things now these do not seem in reality to arise from sloth for spite is seemingly the same as hatred which arises from envy as stated above in question thirty four article six malice is a genus which contains all vices and in like manner a wandering of the mind after unlawful things is to be found in every vice sluggishness about the commandments seems to be the same as sloth while faint-heartedness and despair may arise from any sin therefore sloth is not rightly accounted a capital sin objection three further isidore distinguishes the vice of sloth from the vice of sorrow saying in on the highest good two thirty seven that in so far as a man shirks his duty because it is distasteful and burdensome it is sorrow and in so far as he is inclined to undue repose it is sloth and of sorrow he says that it gives rise to spite faint-heartedness bitterness despair whereas he states that from sloth seven things arise notably idleness drowsiness uneasiness of the mind restlessness of the body instability loquacity curiosity therefore it seems that either gregory or isidore has wrongly assigned sloth as a capital sin together with its daughters on the contrary the same gregory in his commentary on job thirty one forty five states that sloth is a capital sin and has the daughters aforesaid i answer that as stated above in the pars prima secundae question eighty four articles three and four a capital vice is one which easily gives rise to others as being their final cause now just as we do many things on account of pleasure both in order to obtain it and through being moved to do something under the impulse of pleasure so again we do many things on account of sorrow either that we may avoid it or through being exasperated into doing something under pressure thereof wherefore since sloth is a kind of sorrow as stated above in article two as well as in the pars prima secundae question eighty five article eight it is fittingly reckoned a capital sin reply to objection one sloth by weighing on the mind hinders us from doing things that cause sorrow nevertheless it induces the mind to do certain things either because they are in harmony with sorrow such as weeping or because they are a means of avoiding sorrow reply to objection to gregory fittingly assigns the daughters of sloth for since according to the philosopher in ethics eight five and six no man can be a long time in company with what is painful and unpleasant it follows that something arises from sorrow in two ways first that man shuns whatever causes sorrow secondly that he passes to other things that give him pleasure thus those who find no joy in spiritual pleasures have recourse to pleasures of the body according to the philosopher in ethics ten six now in the avoidance of sorrow the order observed is that man at first flies from unpleasant objects and secondly he even struggles against such things as cause sorrow now spiritual goods which are the object of the sorrow of sloth are both end and means avoidance of the end is the result of despair while avoidance of those goods which are the means to the end in matters of difficulty which come under the councils is the effect of faint-heartedness and in matters of common righteousness is the effect of sluggishness about the commandments the struggle against spiritual goods that cause sorrow is sometimes with men who lead others to spiritual goods and this is called spite 
and sometimes it extends to the spiritual goods themselves when a man goes so far as to detest them and this is properly called malice in so far as a man has recourse to eternal objects of pleasure the daughter of sloth is called wandering after unlawful things from this it is clear how to reply to the objections against each of the daughters for malice does not denote here that which is generic to all vices but must be understood as explained nor is spite taken as synonymous with hatred but for a kind of indignation as stated above and the same applies to the others reply to objection three the distinction between sorrow and sloth is also given by cassian in his institutes ten one but gregory more fittingly in his commentary on job thirty one forty five calls sloth a kind of sorrow because as stated above in article two sorrow is not a distinct vice in so far as a man shirks a distasteful and burdensome work or sorrows on account of any other cause whatever but only in so far as he is sorry on account of the divine good which sorrow belongs essentially to sloth since sloth seeks undue rest in so far as it spurns the divine good moreover the things which isidore reckons to arise from sloth and sorrow are reduced to those mentioned by gregory for bitterness which isidore states to be the result of sorrow is an effect of spite idleness and drowsiness are reduced to sluggishness about the precepts for some are idle and omit them altogether while others are drowsy and fulfill them with negligence all the other five which he reckons as effects of sloth belong to the wandering of the mind after unlawful things this tendency to wander if it reside in the mind itself that is desirous of rushing after various things without rhyme or reason is called uneasiness of the mind but if it pertains to the imaginative power it is called curiosity if it affect the speech it is called loquacity and in so far as it affects a body that changes place it is called restlessness of the body when to wit a man shows the unsteadiness of his mind by the inordinate movements of members of his body while if it causes the body to move from one place to another it is called instability or instability may denote changeableness of purpose end of question 35 read by michael shane craig lambert lc